Thank you so much for watching this video explaining DSPY. DSPY is the most exciting thing to happen to AI since Langchain came along and evangelized the idea of chaining together large language model calls. As exciting as ChatGPT is, what's even more exciting are the APIs, where we have the LLM package in an API that we can program into our applications or use to compose these complex programs where the output of one call to the language model is the input to the next call to the language model. So we can break down wildly complex tasks like writing a pull request or a blog post into the research task, the writing task, the editing task. We can parallelize these agents, all these amazing control things we can do, DSPY offers a new syntax inspired by PyTorch to give us this control and flexibility over our LLM programs. Now, the super, super novel and exciting thing about this is how DSPY combines this new syntax with optimization. So we have optimizations in our LLM prompts, like the instructions we give for a task. Like if you're saying you are a re-ranking agent, your task is to re-rank documents, there's some particular phrasing of that that will result in better performance than others. Similarly, if you have to output JSON, hopefully that we'll find a better way to force that than please, please output JSON or give me JSON or I'll be fired from my job. So that's the idea of DSPY, is automatically optimizing the instructions and examples used in the prompt to elicit the kind of behavior that you compose in the DSPY programming model and all sorts of super exciting things. I'm so excited to be presenting this to you. This has been such a fun thing to learn. Let's dive into it. The DSPY story begins with the DSPY programming model. I think the best way to think about this is PyTorch meets agent syntax and LLM programs. So let's dive into more so what that means. So we start off by initializing the components that we're gonna be gluing together in our LLM program. We start off with a retrieval, which could be something like Weaviate, and then we connect it with a query generator as well as something that answers the question. So here you have two different LLM components, or say, two prompts where an LLM performs a task, or this could be a fine-tuned model specialized to this task and the role that it plays in the overall LLM program, which we'll define as the logic in the forward pass. Our first component is the query generator. So there are a couple things to note with this. So first we name the component uh, gen underscore query, and then we have DSPY dot chain of thought. So we'll come back to chain of thought, but let's start with the signature. So signatures, as we go through this lecture, we'll see that there is another way of opening up the signature and writing a longer initial prompt in the doc string and then having a uh, typed input output field. So kind of similar to libraries like Instructor and you know the awesome work that they're doing on <laughs> organizing and cleaning up prompts. And that's another part of DSPY is by using the signature syntax, you can really clean up how the code for these LLM programs ends up looking like. But one way to do it, and I think this will be super popular for say, uh, publishing research papers, you know, doing tweets where you're quickly explaining your uh, new LLM program, all sorts of things is this short ha shorthand syntax. So in the syntax, we're saying context question query. And what this does is DSPY will parse this into input field context, input field question will output a query. And these LLMs are so good at inferring what the variable is supposed to be just based on the name alone. So, you know, if it's context question, a, l a large language model like GPT-4, Gemini Ultra can figure that out based on the name of it alone. So then our second LLM component in the program is the generate the answer. This takes as input the context and the question and outputs the answer. So now the super interesting thing where the power is in your hands for building LLM agents, defining the forward pass of how the how that program is going to interact with the input data as well as each other to produce some kind of output. So we start off with by defining an empty list context. And I hope this also just inspires thinking into seeing how we can have this like local memory in our forward pass, how we can use other functions that aren't, you know, aren't parametric, but can we can put them in the forward pass of our program. So we start off with this empty list of context. We're going to loop through, uh, you can set this as a hyperparameter to the program, say how many hops. So in multi-hop question answering, say you get this, you know, super complicated question. So you need to break it into sub questions in order to answer the question. This is kind of like what captured massive public interest when auto GPT came out was this idea of letting the agent just uh, loop through and say, you know, Am I, do I have enough information or have I completed enough subtasks to start aggregating the task? Is this, this is just this idea of multi-hop question decomposition, but let's stay focused on the DSPY programming model. So first we generate the query by taking as input the context and the question, the input, and then this gives us our query. Then we pass this into our retriever like Weaviate, 
and then we uh, get the context and we continue looping through until we get all the, the context that we need to answer the question. So we're looping, appending to the context, then we're gonna call our generate answer by giving it as input this context. So shortly after ChatGPT came out and just blew everyone's minds with its ability to you know, speak fluently, answer questions, write a rap song in the spirit of your favorite book, or probably most generally just hold a conversation with you, People realized that you could take these large language models like ChatGPT even further by connecting them with themselves in a way in large language model chains. This has been super evangelized by the work of Langchain and Llama Index and definitely looks like the future of building applications with large language models. So to step in a little bit into why chains, chains overcome input length limitations. So you know, I think nowadays you can get about 32K tokens, but at the time of ChatGPT's release, these models were generally limited to say 4,000 input tokens. So chains was one way to break up a complex, like a long input into chunks of it and then apply the processing over each of the chunks and then aggregate the outputs to process long documents. Now, the second most powerful thing about chains that is probably more true today than it initially was, even though the input thing is still kind of funky because it's difficult to supervise these 32K you know, length models, do they really attend over the entire input? So still definitely value to breaking up the input lengths. But the second thing is overcoming overly complex tasks. So if you say, you know, ChatGPT, could you write me a blog post about how to run my application on Kubernetes and even say it, re you know, retrieves your code or whatever. When you have these really long, complex tasks, it's great to break it into subtasks and then have a program for how the language model is supposed to go about the workflow of completing your task. So Chains have also massively improved search capability. So we have things like the example of multi-hop question answering where we formulate a query, then we retrieve, and maybe this is a loop, and then we pass that context in to answer the question. Uh, say we use uh, language models to populate a filter on our search. Uh, say we re-rank documents with large language models. Large language models have played a huge role in search. So as LLM chains evolved, it then became more clear that a better abstraction was to think of these as graphs. And for example, we now have LangGraph, and something that I took from Omar Kitab is to think about these as text transformation graphs. As we have these graphs of computation, the edges pass along a transformation of the text. So as input, we have text, and then we output text that's sent along the edge as the input to the next uh, node that is gonna do a text transformation. So for example, say we have these parallel computations, like we spin up three separate processes of writing a story and then editing a story, and then say we sync up all these nodes into a published stories uh, component in our LLM program. So this could be one way to say, you know, produce a newsletter based on the on the news, <laughs> like what happened in AI Twitter last week, and say we, you know, parallelize writing the story, editing the story, and then we sync it all up into another part of the program that's now gonna like aggregate these stories and form like the coherent narrative of how you would tie all this stuff together. So in addition to text transformation graphs, so we had chains and what was just kind of sequential minded chain, you think like do this, then this, then this, just like a pipeline, just a forward pass. And then a graph kind of opens you up to have say loops and you know big abstractions of like parallel processing that's synced up. That's kind of how I perceive it. But now I think the best way to think about it is LLM programs. You can write graph computation in programs and you can interface tools and control flow and generally just organize all this much better. So quickly before diving further into DSPY, I highly recommend seeing the LLM program galleries that Llama Index and Langchain have both created. They've done amazing jobs of curating the community. They've each you know, discovered tons of useful LLM programs like this. So these two will be linked in the description. I highly recommend checking this out. So as great as these frameworks are for building LLM chains, graphs, agents, programs, they have a lot of lock-in. There's not a ton of flexibility, and that's the first key super exciting thing about DSPY, programming, not prompting. So what is an LLM programming language? I'd say the difference between frameworks and DSPY is that DSPY is a full-blown LLM programming language. And I think there are two key, th key value adds to an LLM programming language. The first of which is to clean up your prompts and structured input outputs to give you a way of just, you know, uh, consistently expressing these things within your programs. And the second thing, and probably the bigger thing, is to control how your LLM modules interact with each other programmatically and open up the box to have this kind of flexibility to customize the LLM program to whatever kind of thing you're imagining doing with these LLM APIs. So 
Let's start off with clean up your prompts and structured input outputs. DSPY does this with the signature. In this example, we have the generate answer that inherits the signature, and we write a doc string that tell, that gives the prompt of what the task is. So in this case, it's answer questions with short factoid answers. Now, a part of DSPY that we'll get into in sort of the second half of this video is that DSPY can optimize these prompts for you. So you can write something, you know, just give it a high level description of the task. You don't need to be tweaking the specific language because as we all know, that can cause, that can massively imp impact the performance is just these subtle changes. So DSPY will then optimize this instruction for you but we'll get into that later. So you also have this way of defining the input and output field. So this is one way to have a consistent syntax of the prompts and the structured outputs and what the variables do for all of the components in your LLM programs. So now the second super exciting thing is controlling how your LLM modules interact with each other programmatically. So let's get into some of these controls. So starting off with control flow, let's say you wanna have a loop in your LLM program. You can easily interface that in the forward pass with this kind of syntax, the for you know, variable name and range if you wanna access the hop somewhere which isn't in this example, but something you could do. And so you, you can interface these loops like for, while, so on. And then you can also have if else statements. So here's a small example that I just wrote up is, you know, you take an email and you pass it into a prompt like email output if, if it's about the podcast. And so it'll first process your emails and then say, hey, is this email about the podcast? And if it is, then you'd say, uh, research this person who's, you know, sending a pitch about joining the WeBA podcast <laughs> as I'm starting to, you know, use this for my life. And so then it will do this research query. This is kind of another thing I'll, we'll talk more about later, but I really like that in addition, in addition to the retrieve, the Weaviate retriever, you also have the U API. So U API kind of similar to perplexity. I don't really personally know the differences too much, but I know that U API is in DSVY. So you can do this web query. So say someone sends me an email, Hey, I'd really like to join the podcast. I can then use my LLM program to format, format a query to do some background research on them. Then go, then it'll send this query to the u.com API then it'll come back with the context and then I can write this potential podcast discussion topics, send that email. Hey, what do you think about these discussion topics? Obviously I would look at it first. Anyway, so hopefully you just see using this for loop, using the if, using the local memory, this control flow that you have of the LLM programs. Okay, so the next big thing, and this is uh, a whole nother paper of DSPY is DSPY assertions. So DSPY assertions are sort of how you have, how you interface this like, uh, the rules that the model should behave uh, should behave. So there's obviously on one end the like you absolutely have to follow this rule. Like in the case of output JSON, <laughs> it, when it has to have these you know these named variables, these types, that's an assertion. That it's like you have to follow this to pass it to the next chain in the pipeline. But then there's also suggestions. So in the multi-hop query, let's say it's generating this query and it writes this super long query you give it the suggestion like, hey, the query should be less than 100 characters, or the query should be distinct from the other queries. And th this is the syntax in DSPY for how you would interface that with under the hood is the super powerful DSPY compiler, which is how it's organizing the prompts, bootstrapping examples to make the LM, you know, do all this stuff <laughs> effectively. So suggestions is one way to do that. And then here's just another example. If you want to have another example of what that looks like, one of the most powerful things is this uh, citation attribution. That's what I, I think makes perplexity so popular is uh, when it's answering the question, it, it has like, hey, this is based on this source from the internet. <laughs> and so you, and so one way to do that is to have this suggestion where it's generated the answer and then it's saying, it's checking if every one to two sentences have citations. And so this would be, you know, a way of interfacing that. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced of the DSPY syntax for offering control and flexibility over your LLM programs. Now for the super exciting thing, this is what makes DSPY completely novel, completely different from anything that's ever been there before, is the optimization built into the framework for defining your programs and then optimizing, say, the instructions, the particular language for describing the task, or the examples, as we'll get into in-context few shot learning and how much that improves performance, or then once you create so many examples that now you can fine tune a model and the benefits of fine tuning the model. I don't know if anyone listening to this has checked out Olama recently, but you know, running LLMs on your laptop is getting super fast. So anyway, so <laughs> DSPY is the PyTorch for LLM programs. So 
PyTorch <laughs> won the LM, uh, the, uh, sorry, not the LM, but the deep learning model training framework battle. And I think this tweet from Andre Carpathy was, you know, maybe it was something that set it over the edge. I've been using PyTorch a few months now and I've never felt better. I have more energy. My skin is clearer. My eyesight has improved. And I think that there's kind of two things to this. In one end, it's the syntax, the way you define the neural network layers, as well as I think there's also something with the eager execution and like PyTorch has, and TensorFlow have different ways of doing that. And I'm not personally super familiar with that under the hood stuff, but so people love the PyTorch syntax. So PyTorch, what you do is you define a neural network and you first initialize the layers that you're going to be using. And when you're defining a neural network layer, like a convolution, you, you have like the input output because this like builds up the, uh, the, the transformation in the graph because a neural network has to be compatible. Like uh, it's matrix multiplications where the out, so if you're connecting this uh, FC fully connected layer two with the, this one, this 84 has to match the 84. Like with matrix multiplication, you have the M by N, N by D. And so those ends have to match. But anyway, so you define the layout of the neural network and you make the, you know, the input outputs compatible with each other. And then you define the forward pass of how it processes the input. So maybe you have some, you know, you reuse some parts of this in the forward pass as we saw these like <laughs> all that neural architecture search stuff. But anyway, so this was the syntax for how you define neural networks. And now we have this syntax for how you define the components in LLM programs, where you initialize it by defining the program by the components, and then you define how the forward pass is going to look. And there were some super interesting analogies for the design of DSPY inspired by PyTorch. The first of which that uh, I took from Omar on the Llama Index webinar and ML Ops Learners is don't expect one layer to do all the work. Add inductive biases and depth. So inductive biases, in, in this example of the convolutional PyTorch uh, network, the convolution has this inductive bias of the weight sharing kernel as it slides across an image pixel matrix. And s similarly, you could say that this, uh, oh, not a good example, but <laughs> these signatures have this inductive bias of what the part of the program is supposed to do. So if you have a signature, like maybe let me just scroll up to one of our earlier examples. So if you have this signature of context question query, you could think of that as like an inductive bias of what this part of the program is supposed to be, this component of the program is supposed to be doing. So right there, that idea of inductive biases is super interesting. And now let's come a little more into uh, depth. So depth in neural networks describes having say eight layers of transformers. And similarly in DSPY, let's say we have eight layers of, um, you know, write me, write a story, edit the story, parallelize that and have a committee of reviewing the story, but that kind of like adding depth, adding components to your program and the connection with deep learning and neural network layers is just super fascinating. So the next B big uh, quote I want to present about DSPY and PyTorch and analogs in LLM programs to training deep neural networks is we typically assume labels only for at most the program's final output, not the intermediate steps. So what that means is in PyTorch, when you're optimizing, so this is an example of a CIFAR 10 classification where you take an image and is this a, you know, let's just say cat or dog, forget the CIFAR 10, but you know, hot dog, not hot dog. And so you only have the supervision at the last layer, the output of this entire program. You, there's no supervision for this second convolution layer. There's no like, you know, here's what this feature map should look like uh, after you've transformed the cat after one layer of convolution. And similarly with these DSPY programs, we don't supervise those inner, so when we have the multi hop question answering system that's breaking up the question into sub questions, we don't have supervision on, on what these questions should be. We only know what we want the final answer to be. And you can optionally add this kind of intermediate supervision, but you don't have to. And that's the power is you can automatically tune these intermediate uh, parts of wildly complicated LM programs by just having a final output. So in our, you know, example of the WeVA podcast thing, it's like, I could just have some discussion topics of some things I've written to people in the past. And that would be all I would need to expand this pipeline to make it wildly complicated and how it does it, its research to produce the discussion. But in the end, it knows here are some examples of the discussion topics. So I optimize the depth, these intermediate components of my program to achieve that kind of result. Okay, so now let's take on a pretty big concept, the DSPY compiler. And I think that uh, it's this will explain the concepts behind it, but I think really the best way is to start testing it with whatever program you have in mind to optimize and start seeing how it's bootstrapping the examples, rewriting your signatures and all that kind of stuff. But 
So let's kick it off with, in my view, I see two things you're optimizing, either the instructions, which is the language like you are a re-ranker agent or you are a query formulator, that kind of thing, as well as the examples. And so examples of input outputs, especially when you then add, say, chain of thought and you want it to you know, input and then say rationale and then answer, being able to automatically come up with these answers is super valuable valuable to me that's the quickest value to add of dspy is if you know you want to add chain of thought or program of thought of these kind of things and you don't want to have to write out the examples yourself of why particularly that's the answer so that kind of like automatic data labeling that's it's like a synthetic data framework is how i see dspy in addition to of course as we discussed earlier i think the programming model is pretty cool but let's dive into it the instruction tuning so the the idea is to end this manual prompt tuning prompt engineering and this manual example writing. So we've had this thing like, you know, if you're trying to have a re-ranker agent, you might try different phrasings of the instruction. Your task is to re-rank these documents will perform differently Then I need your help re-ranking these documents or take a deep breath and re-rank these documents. And further, which prompt performs best for which language model is different. So maybe this one performs the best for GPT-4, but this one for Gemini Ultra, this one for Llama 3 when that comes out. So this kind of like ending the prompt tuning will help you keep up with the new language models like language models are going to keep there be a new language model every probably month or so for I would predict the next year or year and a half at least. So if you want to keep your LM programs up, if you want to be able to just plug in a new language model and then uh, see which you know prompt elicits the behavior. This automatic tuning framework is great. And then there's kind of this funny thing. I'm taking this from Jason Liu, who I think has just done the best job of describing this structured output thing, Pydantic, all that awesome stuff. So like he has this example of like, uh, you know, please output JSON or I'll take a life. Just like this kind of like, I'll pay you a million dollars to output JSON. Like that, that kind of like prompt gestures where you're trying to say output JSON. And so DSPY is about an end to this. So the idea is you start off with the initial signature and then you optimize the optimal signature. So you start off with that shorthand, like answer short factoid questions, or maybe it's that just context question answer shorthand syntax. And so it's going to optimize a, a more thorough description of the task. So the way that works is it's is so this is kind of the interesting thing is there are some prompts baked into the DSPY compiler. So it's like taking an end, it's ending the kind of pre-baked prompts in the chains, but there are some prompts in how it, you because it's using LLMs to optimize LLMs. So you have the this prompt for how you uh, optimize the instruction. So you are an instruction optimizer for large language models. I will give you a signature of fields, inputs, and outputs in English. Your task is to propose an instruction that will lead a good language model to perform the task. Don't be afraid to be creative. So <laughs> that last part, don't be afraid to be creative, that's kind of exactly what we're hoping to end with DSPY. And one of the interesting directions for DSPY is we'll then talk about arrays and ragus and that whole development is use is this part would also be a DSPY program. So, but anyway, so so you would do that and then propose some instructions and then this prompt will take those instructions and sync them up into one instruction. So you have this kind of ensembling and uh, sampling multiple outputs, then aggregate it and produce the thing. So that's how we optimize the signature the description of the task the next thing is examples and examples has been the story of deep learning the key difference though is that in the past you know you read these papers and it'd be like like the squad uh, question answering data set i can't recall off the top of my head exactly but these papers would be like we just collected 200,000 examples of human written natural language inference entailment contradiction things like this so the past story has been people creating just enormous human label data sets. And now because of this, you know, generative models, we can just produce training data from the models themselves to compress into finer, smaller models or to use as examples in the prompt. So to just kind of explain this concept and maybe take a step back in the GBT three paper that came out in, uh, in 2020, they were explaining this concept of few shot learning. This was like really surprising that you could do this at the time. So zero shot means you just have the task description. There's no examples, right? So you've just tweaked that instruction maybe, and you've gotten a really nice instruction and you just go zero shot, no examples in the input. 
One shot then means you have one example, and few shot means you have a few examples. So if you're translating English to French, here are some examples, and then here's the input cheese, and then <laughs> it translates that. So then graduating from few shot examples, where we're taking the examples and putting them in the prompt, we then have full scale fine tuning, where we apply gradient descent updates to the neural network to learn from the examples that we have. So Fine tuning has made massive strides lately with sparse fine tuning like low rank adaptation and there's all sorts of other methods. <laughs> That's just low rank adaptation is the most popular one. But so the difference here is that you're applying gradients to change the parameters of the model compared to just kind of eliciting the behavior with these examples. So it's super interesting whether say, you know, the Llama 2 13 billion parameter model is faster and cheaper than these super large models like GPT-4, Gemini Ultra. But then the question is whether you could just few shot prompt Llama 2 13B or say 7B or Mistral 7B, you know, so on, or whether you want to fine tune those models. And so one part, of, one thing you'll see in the DSPY examples is fine tuning the T5 large 700 million parameter model. So a 700 million parameter neural network can run super fast and super cheaply. And so that's one of the most exciting parts of this whole DSPY framework is you can bootstrap, create examples, and maybe you can just prompt, you know, uh, you, you can, there's even this interesting scale where, of course, you can prompt probably GPT-4 and Gemini Ultra, but you can also maybe prompt like Mistral 7B or uh, Llama 2 and, you know, Llama 3 is coming out. And I'm certain just at the time of publishing this video, there will be a new model. So th this is the interesting scale is when do you want to fine tune these models versus few shot? And that's what DSPY is offering you is a framework to just wrap all the complexity of that and you don't personally need to be bothered with it. So, so that's kind of the idea of examples in deep learning and how it fits in this new LLM programming world. So the first thing that DSPY does is bootstrapping few shot examples. So, you know, you, you have a little bit of a data set and the question now is, uh, which, which of the examples should I be putting in the prompt? So let's say you have uh, 10 examples and you're only going to put four, three in this example of translating from English to French. So that would be one way of interpreting this is which of the 10 should I put in the in the input? And another ex another thing about this is uh, when you want to have the language model, write the examples. So I think the quickest value of this is thinking about chain of thought, where you have not only the um, the input output, but now you want to also have that uh, let's think step by step, and then you have a rationale output. So say you have like you know you're you're ch chatting with your docs, and you, you have an FAQ on your website. This is like the most common thing I've seen, and personally the most common thing I've used with developing with Weaviate is you have an FAQ. So you have labeled question answer pairs and you're trying to sync up, you're trying to tune your RAG system for, with that FAQ. And now let's say you want to add that rationale chain of thought. You know, you've retrieved these contexts from your documentation and you know, the answer is the answer because of this reason. So you want to add that intermediate example, you know, that example, as you're giving it these examples of how to have chain of thought reasoning across the retrieved context from your vector database or however you retrieved it, you, you can now use DSPY to bootstrap that rationale, have the LLM write the rationale. And that leads us to the next question of how do we know the quality of synthetic examples? So you're using, you know, you're using the LLM to produce synthetic examples, whether it's for the case of putting it in the prompt or if you're fine tuning the model. And how do you know if that, if that was any good? So the answer to that is metrics in DSPY. So one metric I think is, you know, a good way to get started is exact match. So if you have short factoid questions like what is the atomic number of oxygen and then you have an answer eight this would work pretty well like is it exactly correct but now the problem with that already is you know eight if you wrote it out instead of writing the number that exact match would say you know, that's not a good answer so there are some ways around this like the f1 score f1 score would be like n-gram overlap if you have slightly longer answers like um you know if, you, if you're uh writing i don't know how to, how to have a good example off my head but Let's say you're saying, uh, why is the sky blue? And it's, <laughs> I've been looking at the DSPY documentation long enough to know this now. It's like that ray light scattering, light scattering effect. And so, you know, if it has those three words in it, you know, there's some overlap in the keywords with what, whatever the language model did write the answer as with that ground truth of, of that ray light scattering effect. So there are these metrics that you have. And then, you know, now when the DSPY box opens is you might want to use LLMs as the metric. 
So Ragus is a super interesting uh, library, which, you know, similar to Lane Chain Llama Index or, you know, even the DSPY signature optimiz optimizer has the prompt of the LLM judge cooked into the framework. It's not like optimizing the, how it, the prompt for how it judges the metric, which gets pretty meta. But uh, Arrays is another paper from uh, Sad Falcon, Katab, Zaharia, Potts which is, uh, you know, using the LLMs to optimize the metric. So plugging in the LLMs as the metric is another DSPY program that will then optimize this other DSPY program. So it's pretty meta. And that's maybe a big part of why I like this so much. So, so you know, the LLM metrics looks like this kind of like, please output a, scale, a score on a scale of one to five, whether the answer is grounded in the retrieved context, question, context, answer. And so that would be a way to have the LLM produce the metric. So Let's connect this back with how, how do we know our synthetic examples are high quality. So now we have teleprompters. So teleprompters describe the optimization loop where we're exploring different instruction writings and different examples in the prompt with that, you know, ascent towards the metric. And so that could be black box optimization where you just say, uh, you know, random searching or Bayesian optimization or evolutionary search towards the metric. Or if you're fine tuning, you can directly optimize for the metric. So this is like the teleprompter is like the system that orchestrates uh, proposing candidate examples for the LLM components as well as, you know, new signatures and, you know, seeing if that's improving the metric. Okay, let's kick things off by looking at the code. More than anything in this video tutorial, I hope that you'll get some experience with writing DSPY programs and get some benefit just from the off the shelf compilers from say, uh, having chain of thought examples for your LLM programs and generally just starting to learn the syntax. Let's dive into an example to quickly get our hands dirty and get some experience with DSPY. So we're gonna do the full end to end, but I think to kick things off, let's look at what a DSPY program looks like. So retrieval augmented generation is one of the most popular LLM chains. It's, you know, kind of a simple LLM chain where you just retrieve and then generate. And the next program we'll look at has this uh, write the query part where you actually do have two LLM programs. But I think this is just a way to quickly get a sense of the syntax. So similar to PyTorch, we have this initialize the components we're going to be using and then defining how they interact with the input data as well as each other in the forward pass through the LLM program. So in this LLM program of RAG, we first uh, take the question from the user, We or you know, the question one is plugged into our app, I started to hate that word user, but anyways. So we plug this question into our retriever, we get the passages, and then we pass the passages into the generate answer. So in DSPY, this is a signature that tells us, that gives the LLM, you know, a sense of the task it's trying to do. It has this kind of shorthand notation of question context to answer, but you can also write out signatures as well for when you want to start the model off with a longer prompt. So similar to say instructor and these super cool libraries around just like <laughs> how you organize these, the, these prompts and how you develop the, you know, how you make the code look nice with say strict typing. And you know, when you require the output parsing, all that kind of stuff. So you, you also have this longer hand notation where you can write an initial prompt in the doc string, and then you can define say types for the field. That's not shown in this example, but you can do that. And you can also give it some description of uh, the input field as well. Or you can just use this shorthand notation where the language model will infer what the variables are used for based on the semantic names of their type. So, you know, question, context, answer, it can infer what, what, that, what that it means in this context. So, so that's the first thing to note is, is using this uh, shorthand notation and the shorthand notation is super powerful for, I think, you know, uh, writing papers where you're presenting some new language model chain, but you would also be able to pass in these longer signatures into the predictors like this, where you're passing in this signature in here, and then it inherits this one. So uh, now what we have is the forward pass where we're just, you know, calling our things anyway. So I think you get the gist. This is a rag program. Okay. So now maybe you're a little overwhelmed, underwhelmed. So let's, let's get into a little bit more of a complex uh, program that has a bit more of this interesting kind of two, <laughs> two LLM programs to be optimizing. And that's really the thing here is you have these LLM programs where you have multiple components and you're optimizing the language model to do each of the intermediate tasks that it's responsible for, for creating some, you know, some impressive behavior as a whole system. So simplified Baleen, uh, Baleen is a multi-hop question answering system from Kitab et al. Uh, the idea of multi-hop question answering is that idea where I give you a question that's too complicated to just <laughs> answer it in one go. So you break the question into sub questions. So 
you know, the the question from this data set that we're about to look at is uh, how many stories are in the castle that David Gregory inherited? So first you'd break that question into, uh, you know, what's the castle? What's the name of the castle? And then you would ask the question of how, how many stories are in that castle? So this is kind of idea of breaking up the question. This is probably one of the most powerful things in RAG. I, I think this multi-hop question decomposition thing is going to take RAG to the next level. It is maybe the most exciting thing out there. Re-ranking is also cool, but I think you'll really appreciate the way that this ties the syntax with this local memory and just how you can build programs like this. So again, so we start off by initializing the components we're going to be using. We're, we're kicking it off with, so again, we wrote a signature for generate search query. So that's where we have the short description of the task, write a simple search query that will help answer a complex question. Then we give it a short description of context, may contain relevant facts, question and query, we're just going to let it, you know, figure that out by the name of the variable. So, uh, so what we're doing is we are assigning our modules. So we have these generate queries, we have a list of the modules. So that might be a little bit confusing. And honestly, I think that, um, you know, I think, I think we'll have to talk to Omar about this one and maybe he can leave a comment on this one, but I think you also could just write it like this. So you, you can just have a self generate query equals DSP chain of thought generate search query. So maybe the, the interesting thing here is if you wanted to have a different program for the first search query compared to the, you know, the second, as we're going to be looping through and generating queries, then you can maybe do it like a list. And w again, we'll, we'll summon Omar for that one. Maybe he can shine some light on that, but I'm pretty certain you can just write it like this. So then we have our retrieval and this could be something like we V8. And uh, so then we have our uh, question answer, where we're going to answer the question based on the information. So now the super interesting thing about this, in the forward pass, we're looping through the number of hops. So say we're only going to let it break our question into two questions, max hops equals two. So we have this loop where we're going to generate the question where we take as input the current context, what we've searched for so far, as well as the question, then we're going to retrieve these passages, then we're going to use a helper function. So already note how you can use these helper functions and add them into your forward passes of your LLM programs and how you can interface this syntax to write whatever you can imagine with these LLM programs. So we're going to deduplicate it and then we're going to keep looping. So it's going to, you know, say you ask it this question of how many stories are in the castle that David Gregory inherited. It's going to come up with the search query for the first search query. Maybe that is the idea of the list. Sorry to be distracting the video with that, but so it's going to generate the first query. It's going to retrieve some context and then it's going to use that as input when it's saying, you know, hey, what's the next query I'm about to generate. So then you aggregate all these contexts and you pass this into the generate answer and it's going to answer the question. Okay, so now before wrapping up, let's just go through the entire notebook to bring all the concepts together. So I've already set my open AI key and deleted it. But first, you would need to have your open AI key, whether you're getting it from the environment variable or however you want to do it. All right, so we import DSPY, uh, then we're connecting to GBT 3.5 turbo. Uh, Colbert is a retrieval model that does this super interesting late interaction thing with the token, with the qu document vectors and query vectors. But anyway, so here's a hosted um, D Colbert of Wikipedia abstracts. And so we're configuring DSPY by setting the language model and this uh, Colbert retrieval model. So you could also plug in your uh, WeV8 URL and um, you, you can see a, a description of how to do that in the uh, WeV8, uh, WeV8 RM in the DSPY. I'll link that in the video as well. Okay, so anyways. All right, so we're gonna be using the HotPot QA dataset. HotPot QA is used to benchmark, benchmark uh, multi-hop question answering. So in a second, we'll see an example of this, but. Um, in the data set, so we're going to be using 20 training examples and 50 examples for uh, validation with our metrics. So that's like just the huge thing that's different about deep learning that compared to what it used to be is we have DSPY, this new PyTorch like framework, to, you know, from Stanford, and it has 20 examples is all we need to optimize it. So this is just like a huge paradigm shift in deep learning. And so marching along, I had to cut the video and re-record because I was surprised at the first example. So. Uh, the first example is the question is at my window was released by which American singer songwriter and I'm not sure that's a multi hop question. I'm pretty sure that 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 that's the author of the song. So let's see maybe another question. Uh, which American actor was Candace Keita guest start with? Okay, now that's a good one. Because to do that first you have to ask uh, what movies has uh, Candace Keita been in and then within those movies you would have to say um, who are who are the American actors in each of them? So that this one's a great example of a question that you you would need to break it up into sub questions in order to answer it. So so this is our training data set that we're going to be using to again optimize the signatures, optimize the examples, or maybe fine tune a model. And then we have the development set that we're going to be we're never going to touch this touch this during training, but this is how we're going to get our metrics out. 
Okay, so these are just some things about the data sets and how you format data sets in DSPY. Uh, so, so first we have, this is the longer hand for DSPY signatures, where we have the doc string that we give it, you know, a description of the task, answer questions, the short factoid answers. We have the input, input, input field, where we could give it a description about it, but we don't have to, we're just gonna use the name of the variable. And then we have the output field and description of that. Uh, so then in this case, we're going to be doing a super simple DSPY program where all you do is just, you know, one layer DSPY.predict. So another kind of interesting thing about DSPY is that you can um, inspect the intermediate output. So this is, kind of, <laughs> this is kind of related to Andre Karpathy's tweet about how, you know, my eyesight's improved, I'm sleeping better, is because um, when you want to see intermediate outputs of neural networks, uh, PyTorch is super great for that. And that's one of the key ways that PyTorch differentiated itself from TensorFlow. And you can also do this kind of thing with DSPY. If you want to, you know, just run one inference with just one layer, you can do it like this. So here's an example of the uncompiled DSPY. What is the nationality of the chef and restaurant restaurateur featured in Restaurant Impossible? Predicted answer: American. So, so right away you're seeing how the, you know, it. it the, I don't know this particular restaurant all that well, but the the story is that uh, it's British, and you need to break this question up, but. Anyway, so back into the DSPY building blocks, you can do language model .inspect history to see the most recent thing that was put into your language model in DSPY framework. So you're seeing how it has the instruction, again, from our signature, answer questions with short factoid answers, you know, input field, see how it's just inferring it from the name of the variable, and then you gave it the short description of answer, and then the inference it was just faced with. Okay, so now let's come back into, again, what I believe is the a uh, key motivating factor of why I would, you know, encourage people to switch to this ASAP is if you want to add chain of thought to your prompts, you just change dspy.predict to dsp.chain of thought and dspy will come up with the rationales for you to add that prompting and chain of thought that like add an explanation, it's always going to be better. It's always cuz you know, if you want to debug it, it's always going to be nice to have that little rationale in there and not only just that it does improve the performance. So here's the example of now you have thought. So we again, we haven't compiled this at all. It's just, a, again, just a forward pass. And if we want, we could also, again, do um, turbo.inspecthistory n equals 1. And we can see the um, now it's adding the reasoning to the prompt. So do you, that's what kind of like the built-in modules do for you is they add this to the prompt. And so... Now we have this intermediate reasoning that's been produced for us. Let's think step by step. And so the language model, you know, th this is just a forward pass again. We haven't compiled this, but already we see it switches from American to British by just adding that um, that thinking step in there. So that's already that's something that I think is the quickest value to to have be had. So here's a quick example of connecting to one of the retrievers. Uh, you retrieve with the question, and you know, here's just like showing you uh like what the inner like what the type is of the outputs um let's see so maybe it would help to see it without the uh formatting so you see you just get like this list of strings the list of strings is what it's expecting from these dsp retrievers. so if, for example you're using it with weaviate it's expecting a list of strings to come out of weaviate okay so this is just like another example of you know querying our colbert uh, that we're accessing again with the URL. Okay, so now let's uh, now let's compile a RAG program. So we're going to start off by with the generate answer signature, answer questions with short factoid answers, the input field, the context um, has the description of it might contain relevant facts. The question, we're just going to get that from the variable name, answer often between one and five words. Okay, so now we're writing our RAG program. So we initialize the components we need, retrieve, and then generate answer with a chain of thought, and then passing in this signature into the DSPY chain of thought. So again, DSPY chain of thought is going to add this part, the reasoning thing to the prompt, and then and then you know when you're doing the inference, it'll have the reasoning. Okay, so but this time we're going to compile it. So in the forward pass, we just you know take the question, give it the question, take these passages, give it you know give it to the question answerer, and that's how we do it. Okay, so now we're in the teleprompter, the optimizer. So first we define our metric. So we're going to be using exact match, which again is, you know, if it's British is the answer, then it's got to be exactly British. Uh, and then passage match. So I think passage match is, in this case, we have supervision on the retrieval as well. But let's just kind of focus on exact match to keep things easy. So the teleprompter is going to be bootstrap few shot examples. So it's going to be uh, looking to add few shot examples into the prompt. And that's how it's going to be optimizing. So then you have compiled rag equals teleprompter.compile. We pass in rag. We have our training set. And then we just do it. So 
you'll see the optimizing it'll stop once it's you know once it's got a certain amount of performance and maybe this is something that we could something that i think could have a little more documentation on exactly how that works but anyway so now we can see these questions. So now that we've compiled our rag, we you know uh, compiled our program. We can run inference by you know passing in the input. So similar to you know PyTorch, how you would pass in a new input to it, and we get this answer to what castle did David Gregory inherit, and all these kind of things. So again, we can do the turbo inspect history if we want to see the uh, when you know we just asked it uh, this question of um, what castle did David Gregory inherit, and we can. It, you know, we can debug like what the last thing that the model sit, s saw was. So we see how now you have these, um, you know, these examples in the prompt of, you know, what it means to, um, to firstly, what it means to answer questions with short factoid answers, and then what it means to follow the format that we want with the, uh, with the question, the rationale, and then, you know, it has a few examples of the thing. So this part right here is again, I, I know I've said this like a hundred times in this video, but this reasoning is what I think is the quickest value of DSPY is you, you want RAG, but you don't want to have to write this reasoning part for your uh, FA. Again, if you're chatting with your docs and you have an FAQ data set, you don't want to have to write this reasoning probably because it's just kind of tedious to do, especially if, especially if you have like all sorts of, com imagine you have eight components and you know, you're like writing the email thing. You don't want to have to write the rationales for each step and so that, I think that sells it pretty strongly. Okay, so if you want to inspect the parameters, the parameters being the examples, this would be how you do that. And then uh, if you want to use the evaluate, so this would be, evaluate would be, um, it's, it's going through that data set and you have the metrics. And so, you know, it's just running the forward pass of your program and giving you that, like, um, you know, what is the exact match and as well as passes match in this example. So uh, again, in this uh, first example, you also have supervision on the titles because the hot pot QA data set, in addition to the answers, it comes with annotations for the, the passages that contain the answers. Okay, so while that's running, maybe we can just kind of march ahead because you know this will help with the, whatever the exact match score was of the program. So I don't think it'll be too interesting to people listening, but. Okay, so now we're looking at multi hop search. So we're graduating from our RAG program, which, you know, was pretty simple. And now we're adding, now we're going to have two LLM components. And from there, hopefully you can imagine how to generalize that to however many you need. Um, but I guess like the interesting thing about this is, you know, that idea of you don't need to supervise intermediate layers in deep learning and neural networks. And now you don't need to supervise intermediate components. It's sort of interesting. We'll see how that plays out. But but in this in this particular example, it's very straightforward how the queries might be like connected to the final answer, whereas maybe your like intermediate steps are more abstract than that. And now we have like the LLM metrics and intermediate. So there's definitely a lot to explore. But anyways, so now we are adding a new component. Uh, oops. So here's the output of the um, sorry. So so just preempting with this finish. But this is the evaluation. This is the kind of thing you can expect. Example answer you know, the final exact match score, and you can see this kind of visualization. Cool. Okay, so so we have our moving into multi hop search. So write a simple search query that will answer a complex question. We have the Baleen. Uh, this is a multi hop system developed by Katab et al in 2001. And what it does is it uh, starts off with the context It's going to loop through the max hops, which is two, It's going to generate a query taking as input the context so far in the question It's going to retrieve passages for the query then it's going to deduplicate these contexts if they're already in the context and then it's going to pass this back in so so um you know say your first question again what was it it was about um it was like an actress and it was uh, what american actors have been in movies with her and so it will um you know it, it will first ask that question of uh what movies has she been in it'll get those answers and it'll add that to the context and it will still have the question so it will it will be in its input see the context it has so far when it's producing that next query to keep answering the question so pretty interesting system in my opinion uh and yeah like there's there maybe i'm going on a tangent but there's been a lot of like re-ranking i think this kind of multi-hop query decomposition is maybe underappreciated this is i'm definitely more interested in this after going through the dsui stuff anyways okay so let me make sure i ran that Okay, so so that's our program. Our uncompiled program is when we're just you know running a forward pass through it, and we can inspect the history to see uh, the last input of the uh, uncompiled uh, program. So uncompiled, we you know uh, we don't have the examples yet. So we just have the prompt, and then we have the context, and then we have this reasoning. But we don't have examples of how to produce the reasoning. 
and maybe you can see that the reasoning so far isn't like not it's not that thorough of reasoning and yeah so so now we'll give it some examples and see how that improves so so the, again this is like a supervision on the intermediate hops and that's something we can maybe dive into in a later video let me know any particular comments you have and i'll i can look into it all right cool so bootstrap few shot metrics so we're passing in the metric all right so now we're compiling this and Okay, so now we've got a pretty interesting thing going where now we're going to be, uh, we have a teacher model to produce the, uh, to produce the supervision for the other model. Uh, so I think I actually missed this detail when I first looked at it, but from looking at it, like for the, as well as everyone watching, it looks like what we're doing is maybe um, we have this passages per hop thing. So it looks like maybe we have a teacher model that only looks at two and then it supervises one with three. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly. I, I personally still need to be running more examples, but I hope this, the purpose of this video is really just to, you know, get the concept together. And so, uh, so yeah, so I think hopefully, hopefully maybe like, yeah, concluding. So, so I think with this example, you, you hopefully got a sense of how to write the syntax and then, yeah, like even for me, I think like I've, you know, not even for me, but like I've been looking at it a little bit, if this is your first time seeing it in this video and I'm still kind of wrapping my head around all the different teleprompters because there's definitely a lot of depth to this whole LLMs, optimizing LLMs. But anyways, I hope you found this useful. Awesome. So I hope you enjoyed this overview of DSPY going through things like the programming model and the compiler and looking through the introduction example, showing basic question answering, adding a uh, chain of thought reasoning, as well as rag and multi hop questions and all these things. So let me leave you with some reasons. I think everyone should start using DSPY today. So first of all, it's a super fun syntax. As Andre Carpathy says, <laughs> you'll, you'll sleep better and your eyesight will improve. It is fun to write these programs in DSPY. It's, you know, it's a really nice abstraction putting, you know, if you do have longer prompts, r organizing them as signatures and passing signatures into the program, it really organizes this kind of stuff. So the next big thing I think the quickest value added, and I know I've said it a lot in this video, but if you want to use chain of thought prompting, you know, especially with the few shot examples in the prompt, you would have to write these rationales yourself. And so I think just the getting around needing to write your own rationales is a really cool, quick win that you pick up with DSPY. Uh, the next thing is, you know, LLMs, are, it's like changing every week almost. It's like last thing was the mixed role of experts. And so you might be switching your RAG program from, you know, GPT 3.5 to that. And then say GPT 4 128K then comes out. And then we have Gemini Ultra and, you know, probably all sorts of language models that we don't know yet are on the horizon, say Coheres command. So the each LLM is sensitive to the particular language that you use to get it to do a task, which is, you know, this prompt tuning, this like that's been the story is the, DSPY is trying to end this manual tweaking of the prompts to make it work for certain LMs, LLMs. So, you know, I can't tell you what the best LLM is going to be in a few months from now. But what I can tell you is that if you want to be able to just recompile your program, change the prompts to whatever the new language model is, writing your prompts into DSPY will give you the, you know, the framework to quickly adapt to these new things. The last thing I think is super interesting is Olama. So Olama is a library for L local LLM inference built on top of Llama C++. And I don't know what's, I don't know, I'm not familiar with everything that's been happening, but when I first tried Llama CPP, my laptop was like, you know, <laughs> it's like about to shut down or something and it was really slow, but you know, I've tried it last week and Olama is fast. And so it, you know, it's getting really fast and it's just super interesting what these local LLMs can unlock. And generally just like, you know, if you can run them on CPUs and stuff, it's going to make it cheaper. And this whole like intermediate program thing, it's all just so compelling. So I think this idea of using DSPY to fine tune models down into smaller models that are served with things like Olama, like, you know, imagining putting the T5 large or I think T5 has this encoder decoder that might slow down the inference compared to, um, anyway, sorry, I'm distracting myself. But anyways, I think this local LLM thing is really exciting. And I think DSPY also gives you the right framework to, you know, see if firstly the local LLMs can do the job and, and then also there's the fine tuning angle. So just a super interesting thing. And so I hope these reasons kind of help motivate starting with DSPY today. So thank you so much for watching. If you want to reach out on X, my Twitter handle, X tw handle is uh, C short and 30. And if you want to send me a direct message, I'd be more than happy to take a look at anything you're building with DSPY and or Weaviate. And, you know, if you want to just ask, uh, ask a question or chat about anything, I'd 
more than happy to do that. And also, um, so it's early with the DSPY Discord, but if you're interested in DSPY and want to have some chats, I highly recommend joining it. It's been a lot of fun, and that'll be linked in the description. Thank you so much for watching.